Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And we're finally getting to it. This is our thoughts on Season 2, Episodes 1 through 6 of Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. Yes, I know last time we recorded the entire season in a single recording. We know better than that now. We spent the same amount of time on the Christmas special as we did the entire season. So we're just going to break it up this time. Yeah, and I don't think the other specials that we're talking about either came out or if they will be later. Because there were, apparently there were supposed to be other specials other than just that Christmas special between the seasons. Yeah, not sure what happened there, mainly because we haven't looked. But here we are again, watching this wonderful show that's just gotten better since they now know that people like it and can actually write a continuous story. Still Monster of the Week, but there actually is more interconnecting things going on in each episode. And congrats on the animation and assets upgrades. Just small tweaks, but definite improvements. Animation, camera angles, like in the first episode, they did a sequence that they didn't do in the previous seasons. There was a lot of still camera work in the first season. This had a very dynamic camera that was swinging around the action and doing panning and zooming and stuff like that. It was a whole different setup. Also, like you said, little things that you don't really notice until you go, wow. And you realize, that's why I went, wow. Like, oh my God, Adrian's hair. Yes, seriously. <laughs> and just even the suits look better. It's like they think they just flipped a switch in their rendering program and said, make things prettier. There actually is kind of a switch like that. It's the material settings. You basically go, add a little bit more shine to this to make it look more like the texture you're going for, which I think they turned off because it does add a lot of extra rendering time. But I think they've managed to uh, gain some more processing time and it's definitely showing. And just Adrian's father... He's so complicated, yet so simple. And I love how the first episode of season two is, let's confirm what everyone's been suspecting from the first episode. Yeah, it's his father. No more fan speculation. It is officially confirmed. But this is the second time that I recall that he has done something to defray suspicion from himself. Because in the Jackety episode... That would be the hypnotist for those watching in English. In the Jackety episode, he is put under control of the person that Papillion akumatized. So the question is, was he actually under that person's control? Or was he really taking that risk? Because he knew that he was the target of that person's emotional distress. Hmm. So... Is he immune to the effects of the akumatization? I think so. Especially since it's his power, I think he may actually be immune, especially based on the fact that he was akumatized, but he wasn't actually akumatized because there was plenty of instances of him acting like himself and not a crazed loon. So I was specifically talking about when he was hypnotized in the whole airplane jump off a building thing. Was he actually being forced to act that way by the power of the person he akumatized? Or was he faking? How big of a risk did he take there? And I was basically saying that I don't think it affected him because of what we saw in this, the first episode. But he renounced his Kwame. He gave up his Miraculous at the beginning of the episode before he was akumatized. Hmm. Because he went, Novu, I renounce you, and remove the pen. Interesting. Because my question then was, how does he manage to get akumatized? Because he sent the akuma after himself as Papillion, and then renounced Novu. So how was the butterfly still empowered to akumatize him when he gave up the power temporarily? Hmm, that's a good question. I never actually thought about it like that. I almost say that the power was still residing in the butterfly and it probably would have eventually like burnt off or evaporated, but it found its host quickly enough. Well, it basically didn't go anywhere because it was 
He akumatized the butterfly. The butterfly flapped around for a second and came right back to him. And I also want to say he was a bit more in control, not just because of his behavior, but because he wasn't focused on an individual. It's Adrian's fault the book was gone, but mm. he, he still didn't go after his son. He went to create a new collection in his book. Because often when an akumatized individual blames a single person, that single person is usually a target and everyone else is collateral damage. Like how the artist specifically went after Chloe and the knight went after the mayor. You know, there were still other people who were collateral damage, but their focus was one individual. Like the photographer, he took out a lot of people, but his goal was to get a uh, jagged stone. Also, try not to be a new person in, this, in a series like this. You're guaranteed to be the monster of the week. Yeah, yeah. D don't be the new person in town. Don't be the new person in class. Don't be the new anything. Because like, the moment I saw any new person, I was like, yeah, there, there are monsters this episode. Yeah, yeah, because one of the things that has kind of impressed me so far is that we haven't had a re akumization of characters, which makes sense from Papillion's standpoint, because if the person failed you once, why choose them again? But in terms of the overall show assets, that means you're only getting to use every villain design once or twice, because we have had some come back with the doll episode when the reporter's daughter was able to use the dolls to summon those akumatized characters. Also, we've had some interesting akumatizations in these episodes so far. Like the grandmother. My goodness, the name Belfana reminded me of the Italian witch. I want to say she comes on solstice, but she gives out candy. But I know there's another witch, I think is might be German, that was a, had a name something like Brichette. And she was one where you never really knew if she was going to pull the gifts out or stuff the kids in. Ooh. Because Grandmama was doing basically a punish the naughty and recruit the polite. Yeah, that was kind of a confusing one for me. I'm like... Okay, I understand the whole coal thing because naughty. I'm like, how does the whole angel slash fairy thing work? I was trying to figure out what mythical thing she was associated with. I know it's not like standard for this series, you know, have their creatures based on mythology, but this one definitely felt like it was based on some type of mythology. And it was very interesting. Also interesting was like okay how many times have adrian and marionette each been the target of an accumulatization because i think this might have been the first one for marionette in her civilian form mm. because the anti-bug and oh i can't remember the name of the uh, fox girl the illusionist those were both against ladybug her hero form not her civilian form and so was the reporter. The reporter was after her hero form, not the civilian form. I just remember to speak about that episode. <laughs> the public wants to know, are you two a couple? The entire internet wants that. <laughs> uh, yes, people. Understand that ships are fun to play around with, but they are not your right to demand that the show people put that in the show. Because once the romantic tension is resolved, if that's a main focus of the show, it's just going to kind of trail off. I seem to remember, I don't know if I'm remembering the show's name correctly, but was it called Honeymooners? Uh, not a series I watched, so. Okay. Well, I seem to remember this one where um, Bruce Willis and another girl, there was, the whole series basically revolved around their romantic tension, and I believe he was a detective of some sort. And basically, at one point in the series, they finally got them together, and then the ratings tanked, so they canceled the series. So if your show's relying on romantic tension, you can't necessarily resolve it, even though that's what people say they want. Though, now that I think about it, 
the ratings at that time weren't that accurate. Ratings are often inaccurate with television. My grandparents had a box at one point. Hmm. And we had to write in for Nielsen ratings. So it always got gummed up when I was being watched while my parents were at work because it went from news, news, cooking show, She-Ra. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just remember the fun fact of like, Star Trek wasn't popular when it was on TV. Then they looked back at their records again and went, oh, shoot, it was actually popular with the audience we wanted to target. <sighs> Dang it, because they actually had accurate records. They were just looking at the information wrong. And the original Star Trek was targeting that perfect audience of 18 to 24-year-olds. And got it. Yep. Yeah. No, they weren't actually, I'm saying they weren't targeting that, but ah. that's what was watching but that's what the advertisers want they want that's the perfect market to advertise to because most of them have cash they can throw away because they're not careful with their money they're not yet air quotes responsible adults mm -hmm. so if you can get them and get them hooked you most likely have them hooked for life that's actually the better time to get a person hooked on your stuff than a kid i mean because a kid will just grow up and forget your product <laughs> Or they'll remember it in a completely nostalgic way, which is not how you want to sell it. But moving on. Because this is not something we want to tangent a lot on, because we have a lot to say. Yes. Like, on to another interesting fact about Grandmama. When she was akumatized. <laughs> uh, specifically, Papillon said something, and she went, what's the magic word? Akumatized Grandmama was not taking nothing off of nobody. Even Papillion had to remember his please and thank yous. Yes. Is it the translation that would have on Netflix? Like you said, she ain't taking nothing from nobody. Ooh, grandmas. You don't want to mess with grandmas. No, no. Because remember, they were mothers first. Oh, wow. And the other interesting akumatization was one that I was trying to figure out. It's like, we, we won't re-akumatize people, will we? Because we were dealing with an episode where Max was doing stuff and I'm like, is he going to get akumatized again? Because I didn't, like, really think that... No, the robot can't... He's an object. He can't get akumatized. Apparently, he has real feelings. Yes, people, treat your electronics nicely, because one day they may get turned into evil creatures that will threaten your life. Or try to enslave you by making you their friends. But that was so surprising to me. I was like, I like that concept. Cool. My main nitpick on that episode was the animated electronics and machinery it's always been a nitpick for me going back to 80s ninja turtles of an object moving when it wouldn't normally move when april o'neill and her co-host got attacked by a typewriter i could understand the typewriter flinging paper maybe dislodging key or a gear but actually hopping around like it's possessed not so much Especially with the way he was affecting things, it felt like it was more like just turning them on and pointing them towards things. So if they can't move on their own anyways, they shouldn't be able to move on their own even if they're magically enhanced. So like a refrigerator should be able to just turn itself up to nice and toasty so your food goes bad, but it can't chase after you. It shouldn't be able to swing its doors open and hit you. You know, your telephone should be able to ring with the most annoying ringtone it can download from the internet, but it shouldn't be able to fling itself at you. Or send your grandmother all of your porn. Ah, oh, Weird Al reference check. Ah, <laughs> oh, Weird Al. What a wonderful concert that was. I wish there was one that was closer by that we could go to again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish the ones that were closer didn't sell out in two seconds. Yeah. Also, congratulations on the Star of Fame. Yeah. And back on topic. Yep. We're trying not to tangent. That episode was really neat because of that concept. I'm like, that's a neat concept. It proves that this is an actual feeling creature. Max is really lucky or very... I know he's smart, but wow. He beat out everyone else with artificial intelligence. That's either amazing or terrifying, probably a little of both. Especially since it has attachment issues. Also, kudos to a kid's show for exploring the issue in the way they did. It wasn't just a, oh, this is a thinking, feeling thing. 
We have Max in a quandary at the end about should he reactivate Markov? Look at what happened. Mm. And our hero's pointing out that there's such a thing as forgiveness and learning from your mistakes. Because pretty much no one who's been akumatized has had it held against them. There was like one episode where a couple characters walked into class and started naming off everyone who had been akumatized. <laughs> but for the most part, it's not held against people. Also, I was afraid they would have to break his processor since that was the part that was affected. I was concerned about that. And I liked how much ahead of them he was getting because a computer program that well could process and outthink in terms of logical and rational thought. And also being one of the first to look to actively betray Papillion. Yeah, that was a real nice twist. Because I've been waiting for that. It was also a great way to explain the wish system for how if someone were to wear both the um, Cat Noir's ring and Ladybug's earrings, how they would gain the power to make any wish come true at a cost. Then the, that cost is the type of thing that you usually aren't going to want to have to pay, which is the thing with a lot of items. You know, the more you're getting, the more you're giving up. Like how we theorized if Papaleon uses the wish to bring Adrian's mother back, Adrian's the one who's paying the price. Yes, we went that dark. It's us. Also, I can't remember the theory I came up with with what would happen if Ladybug, which is probably the scenario that would happen at the end, would do to rectify everything. Probably wish Adrian back to life and say, take me. She would probably offer herself instead. So that would be the scenario if Ladybug got a hold of both objects to undo the damage. The one that's probably more likely is the mother being the one to undo the damage because that's her son. And it's her life that was bought. And as a holder of the Peacock Miraculous, she probably has a really good understanding of the powers, at least of her own object. Though that reminds me, aren't those silhouettes in the new intro fascinating? Yes, yes. I'm like, hmm, don't those kind of coordinate to all the colors of the Kwamis that we saw in the intro sequence in the first season? And, hmm, that one silhouette looks a lot like we're going to get the illusionist back in her fox form. Yeah, I had a theory about that in the first season. Like, I think she will become... That character. Because it was a match for a drawing in the book. And we've now had it confirmed that the book has a lot of information about the Kwamis. And I love how the answer was to scan a digital copy. I also love how Adrian's father already had a digital copy and still did all that stuff. That was really, like, dude, use the, you know, modern world. They didn't even do the usual explanation for, oh, we can't do that because digital devices can't capture this object because of its magical power. Why do you even have that? Because you don't need it anymore. Just see, like, I can just take pictures of it. <laughs> that makes total sense for a modern era thing like that. Just make sure it's not backing up to Google Cloud. Because who knows what's going to be looking at those. I mean, I trust Google and everything, but if you're dealing with an object you want to keep secret. Yeah, local backup, you know, get yourself a Drobo. Not a sponsor. Hey, Drobo. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it looks like Nancy knows that De Grasse is Papillon. Just to make sure we're talking about the secretary-like lady? Yes. Yeah, and I think, like, she may be with a Kwame at one point. I'm just wondering, with her position, if she's going to end up with the peacock. Maybe. I also think that at the very end, after everything's wrapped up, Adrian's not going to get his mom back. But she may end up being with the dad to console the dad. Kind of a whole, like, I've been with you through all of this. Why didn't you ever see me? And he finally realizes... Oh, I shouldn't have been doing this and going after my dead wife. <laughs> I should have been living my life. Yes, yes. Honor and remember the dead. Be with the living. Don't pity the dead, Harry. <laughs> Can't remember the rest of that line, but basically it's like, yeah, the dead are okay. They're dead. It's the living you have to worry about. Um, to go to another comedic singer, the dead can't hurt you because they already left. 
but what they left can sure make you hurt yourself. <laughs> Ray Stevens, check. And so, let's see, we've talked about Adrian's father, we talked about the newscaster, we talked about Grandma, we talked about Markov, we have not talked about the fencer. Who I think may also become a Kwame master, but on the good side. Yes, because, wow, she kicks tail. Not just that, that symbol that kept showing up in the episode is a family crest, and Adrian looked it up, and when the writers point out something like that, it's not just important for the episode, because they emphasized it, they emphasized it a lot in the episode, which means it's important in other ways than... It may match up to something in the books. I don't know why I said books plural, mainly probably because there are now three copies. There is the physical book, there is... De Grasse's digital copy, and there's Ladybug and the Master's digital copy. And speaking of Ladybug, I love the whole she looks just like Ladybug thing. <laughs> For uh, Riposé. Adrian, uh, your, your jaw goes back up here. Uh, we also forgot to mention the... Uh, it was this episode, wasn't it? Where Adrian gets snagged and has trouble transforming because marionette keeps coming back because that's something i wanted to point out to go between the two episodes when each of their civilian forms is a target it the difference in how they're treated because ladybug is totally gone over adrian so she is like super protective where marionette has a much easier time getting away from chat noir to transform when she's the target of her grandmother hmm Going back to annoying things in the episodes, he's a cat. Those bars were a good inch wider than he needed them to be. He could have slipped right through them. He had no need to use, other than plot point and story focus, to use his destruction on those bars. He could have just gone one step, two step. I've seen cats make it through areas much skinnier than that. He should have been able to get through those bars just fine. I mean, I could have gotten through those bars. And I've got a big head. I'm working on it, folks. <laughs> and how she locked him in the sarcophagus. And then kissed the outside of the sarcophagus. Oh boy. Somebody is severely crushing. Oh yeah, and going back to the grandma episode, the um, gift too, from Adrian to... Marinette. Yeah, the luck charm. Also, the gift from Tiki. Oh, yeah. It's like, <laughs> that's going to end up being important somehow. Because it sounds like it's almost done every generation for each ladybug. And the guide also mentioned that the book could unlock more powers for them. And I'm wondering what those more powers will be. Well, uh, Ladybug's already really OP if you think about it, because her lucky charm gives her an object that will let her win, and her lucky sight lets her figure out how to use it. Then she can use the object to undo all the bad stuff that happened. It's basically a Code Lyoko return to the past without making Xana stronger. And then she can use the yo-yo to catch the butterfly and purify it. Yeah, I have a feeling that it's going to be like something that's a minor version of whatever their full-blown power is, and they can use it more often. Something that doesn't cause them to detransform within five minutes. Like maybe it takes away a notch. But not all the way down. So they can only use it so many times. And then their SOL, and then it means they can't use their big power until they recharge because they've already taken a notch. Hey, story writers, we got ideas for you. I know this season's already complete and everything. They're just not all out yet, but still. I'm waiting for them to re people, but I'm just wondering about the circumstances. Will they be the exact same villain with the same power, or will it be varied? Hmm. Maybe Papaleon will unlock new powers, too. Considering that the Master said the book could do that, that means since Papaleon already has the book, if he's been studying it this whole time, he should be able to figure out other things to do and if he ends up with other people with kwamis on his side he may not need to accumulate people every episode now 
which would allow for another formula change because our heroes wouldn't know that at first. They'd be looking to deakumatize the person because until they detransform, the Kwamis can't go, I recognize that person, i.e. I recognize the form the, of the power that that Kwame grants. Interesting. So much fascinating stuff. Anything else you'd like to go over? Yes. Also, because they bring the images up in the newscaster episode, the number of times Adrian as Chat Noir has become a subject of the akumatized individual as opposed to Marionette, because there have been several instances where he's been forced to change teams by the akumatized character. And I don't remember a single instance of that happening to Marionette yet. She lied and said she was turned into one of the mummies because she was hiding her identity from her friend. But Adrian's fallen at least twice because the Cupid episode and the Princess Fragrance episode, both times he's going up against her. And that reminds me of the whole part of the episode where they were getting the interview and she shows the fact that Marionette as Ladybug kiss Cat Noir and he's like, what? He's like, why don't I remember this? Like, uh, you were under an evil spell. It didn't count. That episode was just pure fan service. Very much so. You want them to get together? You want them to get together? Huh? 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 Not yet. No, no, because what we need is for Adrian to recognize more of Marionette's value. He already values her as a friend, but he doesn't see her in a romantic light. And Ladybug is not in the least interested in Chat Noir because of the way he acts. There's more of a differentiation between Adrian's civilian and hero personalities than Marinette's. Mm -hmm. And it works well with his lifestyle, if you think about it, because he's been very isolated most of his life. So the first time he gets true freedom, he's going to go a little crazy. And that's what Cat Noir gives him. It's kind of like what happens between Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Peter Parker doesn't do wisecracks. He's a very scientifically focused person. But then he's Spider-Man and he's free to be this crazy, strong, powerful, quick-witted thing saving people. He doesn't have to be restrained like Peter Parker does. And the variances in personality also help in disguising your secret identity because even if someone goes could they no nah, he'd never act like that yeah adrian would never be uh, be that crass uh though i would say um cat noir is more of a tomcat little bit have we well we have gone over a, a couple of nitpicks any more nitpicks you'd like to go over there's not a whole lot to nitpick. Grandma's acumatization felt so much like the Christmas special because you even had a little bit of a song. You had the flying vehicle. Yeah, I got that sense too. I was like, this feels kind of like a holiday episode. Like I said, the, the Italian witch Belfana comes to mind. I have a feeling she is based on that. Just they tweaked it up for what they wanted for the episode. I think so. and. I was also waiting in that episode since even she was concerned about getting hit by her projectiles. Mm. I was waiting for that to be a thing. Either Ladybug as her hero form or Marionette taking a hit and protecting the Belfana form from her own weapon when it backfires. But they kind of use it as the linchpin at the end of the episode of how to get her to stop moving so they could... Destroy the object, purify the Akuma, and reset everything. Another interesting thing about this reset compared to Code Lyoko, too, is Code Lyoko memories got reset, too. Everyone but the characters. In Ladybug, everyone remembers except for the person who was Akumatized. It would be very difficult for Ladybug and Chat Noir if everyone forgot everything every single time because... They would have to keep re-explaining themselves. I'm just saying that's a big difference between the two I didn't really actually put together in my head until just now. Well, a lot of what happens in Code Lyoko takes place in the digital world. While there are effects in the physical world, most of the battling is going on in Lyoko. 
Man, that's a show I would love to see rebooted and story done properly. I would actually like to finish watching the entire series, too. I happen to have it, but I haven't had the time to sit down and watch. I think it's a hundred some odd episodes. Then it's not so much more well written, it'd be slightly more streamlined. Yeah, and better voice actors, which is interesting fact about Kolioko. The voice actors you hear for the American dub were actually done in France. American actors who happen to live over there and speak English and French. Which is a really cool thing and something that makes a lot of sense in a global market to have multilingual voice actors so that you are keeping the same character voice, the same actor, and being able to distribute to multiple countries. A little hard for voice actors who only speak one language. Uh, I can see value in it because then you have less of the sub versus dub fights. Though I've watched some really interesting videos lately on uh, sub versus dub and what you actually get out of dub versus sub, especially nowadays with the different translations and how they handle dub translations now and how they actually do the, um, uh, it's not Americanization. Localization. Localization now. How they try to mix a little bit of the Japanese culture into it, but also pull it back a little bit to have a little bit of more of American. To make it a little more relatable instead of Americanize everything. Thank you for kids. Yep. Water guns. Or the invisible. These are my fingers. I knew we should have used the invisible tank. Things we are behind on. We are behind on Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged. Yeah, that's like one of those things of like, how? One episode releases every blue moon. How? <laughs> so should we wrap things up or is there more points you'd like to go over? I think we touched on most of my major ones. The whole thing with how Adrian's father goes through so much to divert suspicion away from himself. He does a really good job at that. Because Marionette was all set to believe that he was Hawk Moth. Yes, switching to English for the sake of variety. Because the design was repeated so much and she even got Adrian to start thinking about it. But then with him being akumatized, oh, he can't possibly be Papillion now. Clever. Scheming and clever. And I seriously think he suspects Adrian is Chat Noir. Hmm. If not him, the secretary. So many interesting things to look forward to in this season, and so many interesting things we already saw in these six episodes. And it's 26 episodes? That's 20 episodes left? Woohoo! Because there's a lot going on here, because I don't think we're going to have a Chekhov's gun. All this stuff is really going to come back and be utilized. I think there may only be 16 episodes out right now. That's okay. You know, we have other stuff to do. Theoretically, we also have lives. Though I missed that one up last week, so I have less than you. Funny. Thought so. And I'm still waiting for Chat Noir or Ladybugs them themselves to be akumatized. That is going to be interesting. Those two would be the ones who would be most able to resist. So if there is actually a no option versus a you are forced to become this option... We're going to see it with those two because they will recognize what's happening. Mm. They have the best chance of recognizing what's happening, I should say, because they don't know how Papillion speaks to his victims. They only know that they've been akumatized. The real question is, how do they undo it, especially if it's Ladybug? If it's Ladybug, we're in a lot of trouble. But the question is, can someone de themselves? Kind of like the uh, Christmas episode in Cute High Earth Defense Club Love Love where the reindeer goes back to normal on his own. Because I thought that that might happen with Belfana if the story played out the way I said with the sacrifice of, oh, she really does care. I'm in the wrong to be going after her to punish her. Like I said, there's so much to talk about. I know. And does that whole episode of I know they're throwing me a surprise, right? Marionette, how do you know that? I know. Parents are always the first to know. And how they have to keep hiding the cake. <laughs> uh, uh, that poor cake. Or cakes. Yes. 
Always in the trash can. Oui. And I'm like, you guys operate a bakery. As long as you hadn't written her name on it yet, you couldn't say it was a client order. It just happens to be her favorite flavor and frosting. And <laughs> well, she wouldn't see the flavor because it's frosted, so it just happens to be her favorite colors. Also, apparently it's very hard to keep that kind of secret from Marionette. Because she like, had the whole thing predicted. But apparently this has happened for multiple years, so ah. it gets to the point where you expect it. Or can see the signs of it coming from a mile away. Kind of like when you're watching your favorite trope. Mm. You know, you've seen it so many times, you're like, okay, there it is. Yep, yep, it's coming. It's coming. Almost there it is. Even if they twist or spin, you're like, ah, oh, I see how they changed that part. Oh, but they kept this part. Okay. And to wrap things up with, we love this show. We can't wait to watch another six episodes. And this has been our thoughts on Miraculous. Kegels of Ladybug and Chat Noir, Season 2, Episodes 1 through 6. And this is why we didn't do the entire season, because, look, we forgot an episode. Just editing it here right at the end, right after I just told you you listened to us talking about Ladybug. So, hi. <laughs> so, it's not just that we're trying to milk the season for all it's worth in terms of the total number of episodes. It's that we're used to doing in sets of five, and we went, oh, yeah, we got all five. Oh, yeah, we're recording six episodes. We forgot the episode where Chloe once again tries to be less of a um, witch. Ooh, nice dodging a bullet there. And I like, was it her butler? Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanted to make sure because there's just several different types of servants and I wasn't quite sure which one she was interacting with. And apparently a favorite stuffed animal from something, I can't remember what. From her childhood, it was a nice little flashback to give us some more information about Chloe's background. Divorced parents, mother left. Also character development. Yay! Because we need more of that from Chloe because first season, complete one note villain. I think she's single-handedly responsible for the most akumatizations. Including this episode. I almost thought we may end up getting another Chloe. I thought we could possibly re akumatize Chloe because she was getting so frustrated at having to play nice because she didn't want to lose precious Adrian's friendship. Adrian's a sweet kid. I wouldn't mind having his friendship, but Chloe, just be less of a brat. My goodness. And that reminds me of that wonderful scene in the episode where she tries to, not tries to kiss, but is forced to do the French greeting kiss to Marinette. Marinette, yeah. Who apparently is like her least favorite person in the world. Mm hmm. And vice versa. Mm hmm. And everyone was like, radio. Okay, they were all staring at them. <laughs> like, oh my God, is this really, really going, going to, to happen? happen? It, it was like the part where they had to say Merry Christmas to each other in the Christmas episode, only way more intense. Mm-hmm. Fun episode. And I like the concept of the um, akumatized form. Why the heck is he a mech pilot piloting a stuffed animal? <laughs> because. And his ability is basically to glom on and take people over. So he's a mech pilot driving a stuffed animal whose ability is puppeteering. Yeah, that's kind of a couple of layers there. Like, why didn't you just keep full-sized? Oh, well, I, I get the whole the item is the stuffed animal and everything. But still, I'm like, that's a, it's a great concept. But my brain still goes, why? <laughs> because it's more subtle. Something small is harder to see at the party. And it's less disruptive to the party. Ah, though the party did get quite a bit disrupted. Just a little bit. Also, I love the part where the butler, and if he's not a butler, we're sorry, you can correct us in the comments, but he is an upper servant. When he first brought the chocolates and Chloe's just, like, devour. I also like how he kept popping up to go, once again, radio. Um, he was popping up and holding out the stuffed animal and going... You wouldn't? Come on. <laughs> you have to be nice like he's always been to you. This show is just so good. This episode was just 
wonderful. <laughs> that butler. And how Chloe's reactions. I'm like, yay, actual depth of emotion here. Because we go from, oh, here, yes, so glad to help you. And uh, you want ice? Just all over the spectrum. And she is, God, she's still just such a brat. I mean, really, pulling the fire alarm because she found Marionette's father's cooking lesson boring. Oh, yeah. You forgot the beginning of the episode. The whole reason that she ends up throwing the party because Adrian called her out on her misbehavior and said, you need to start being nicer or we can't be friends. Because apparently the only thing Chloe truly works about losing is Adrian's friendship. I'm still trying to wonder if it's more of a status thing or if they're actually friends. Because it sounds like they have known each other for a while, but... I'm assuming they've known each other for a long time. I think Adrian even said that one time. He'd known her for a long time. Because she's the only other rich kid we've seen. So that's the kind of circle he would have moved in before uh, his mother mysteriously disappeared, presumably dead, and... He basically got put on lockdown, grieving parent overreaction. So, because early on when, um, great, now I'm blanking on his best friend's name. When they make friends earlier on, it's like, dude, come on, have friends. It's easy. And with, you know, the regular school students, he gets a more of a taste of what real friendship is like, not the... Oh, yeah, we hang out because our parents visit each other. And while they're visiting, we hang out. Which is how a lot of your childhood friendships start. Mine was usually, oh, you're not a cool kid, too? Awesome! Or, I can draw pretty things. Watch. Or, hello, computer. <laughs> and that's where everything went downhill. But, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you still do the draw pretty things. Watch this. I mean, look at this. <laughs> exactly. Though the, the Adrian's father is like an example of the two sides of what happens when a parent loses their partner. Either you become a hero or you become a villain. Because you are either super parent because you are now doing everything alone or you are... Evil because you turn all of that dark emotion inward. And start blaming or trying to fix the problem in the uncorrect way. Yeah, yeah bring people back to life. Yeah, that's, that's not going to be a thing for like a while. We can kind of do it now virtually, but it's not the real thing. And probably still not recommended at this point. I mean, wasn't there even a Wii U game about that? Uploading your memories to the cloud? Hmm. I don't remember that particular game, but I mostly think about Ghost in the Shell. That works, too. Uh, where you basically just move your consciousness from body to body. Very handy. Oh, I broke this one. do 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 <laughs> Anything else you'd like to go over in this? Well, considering how long we talked about the other five episodes, I don't think we really need to go too heavily into it. We just need to talk about it because we did say this was episodes one through six, and we can't call it that if we only talked about five of the six. Well, thank you for listening to this pickup. Hey, yeah, we, we did a pickup. We didn't want to disappoint you because you guys were probably counting going, they said six, but they've only mentioned five akumatized people. Or why did they mention that one? And this is why, because we remembered right after we finished doing the outro. So yay, pickup lines. This is also why we don't do things live. And to the real outro. Bye-bye. Oh my God, we made it to the ending? You made it to the ending? Good! We both, we both are here now. That means I can chill stuff. I mean, I can tell you about things and hopefully get you to stay around for more episodes. Because we got plenty. I think there's well over a hundred. Oh yeah, especially if you include the other show we do on Wednesdays. Ember's Reading Room. That will be fun to watch. Go ahead. Enjoy us reading and talking about children's stories that we used to read as we were, when we were younger. You know, from an adult perspective. Oh, you, you just like my art? Well, there's links for that downstairs. To the right. No, the other right. No, my right. There you go. And 
If you want to support this channel, you can subscribe if you're new here. Hello, welcome. Or you can give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. Also, you can support us through Patreon and Coffee. Patreon's a dollar a month. It gets you uh, the chance to let me know what you think of my drawings and maybe suggest some drawings. That dollar a month also gets you the right to vote on Patreon-only polls, where you can vote on the comments that I pick out to make my new drawings. Like if you suggest Cat Noir in a yellow suit, I may put that into a poll and you can vote for that particular thing. Or you can go for a more direct route and just commission me for that. I accept those too. Oh yeah, and coffee? That's three dollars, one-time fee, through PayPal. It's a really nice service. You know, make it so I can stay up late at night drawing stuff for you and other people. It's wonderful. Coffee, coffee, jump, 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 jump. I mean, uh, I did not have 14 cups of coffee this morning. What are you inferring? Oh, and uh, here's Amber. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.